Dean and I started out from West Palm Beach this morning at five minutes after seven. And uh, and it's kind of good in a way to get away from West Palm Beach. Have you heard about what's happened down there? We had a visit by Wilma. This is actually our third hurricane we lived through in the two years we've been down there. Um, of course, we saw Wilma coming. Uh, category five hurricane, the strongest hurricane, Atlantic hurricane on record is coming right at us. And uh, we were the bullseye. Uh, and it, it truly, for, for a week, we knew it was coming right at us, and it sure did. The bullseye went right over us. And in fact, uh, the eye of the storm was uh, covering the, the entire uh, Palm Beach County. And uh, came and, and it went. It was quite an experience. But amazingly, God. God was good. Uh, by the time it reached us, it was only about a Category 2 hurricane. So we were spared the, the devastation like they had in New Orleans. It really, it, uh, uh, we came through quite well. At our home, we, we lost some branches, uh, lost some trees, and so uh, I don't take that too far. I'm going to it. Okay. Um, lost some branches and some shingles. The worst thing of all, of course, is losing our electricity for a number of days. But uh, we're through, and we're glad to be up here for a little while and, and relax. Uh, this is the fall retreat of the Finger Lake CFO, and also the fall retreat for Zone 4. We at Finger Lakes are honored to have brothers and sisters from other camps in the Northeast uh, to be with us. Let, let me just see hands again of, of the people that are new. You've never been to CFO anywhere, anywhere at all. Just you? Uh, well, for campers old and new, uh, our strong suggestion is that you participate in everything. Uh, there's quite a variety, you know, talks and times of singing and devotion and emotion choice of, of creative activities that we'll learn more about tomorrow morning, meals in the dining room, let's move around and, and sit with different people and share, have rest hour and recreation, zone four session tomorrow afternoon, prayer groups and evening snacks, morning meditation tomorrow, uh, prayer box and letters to God, communion, I think there's communion, I assume there is, and a blessing service, and a sharing time. And I hope that you'll enter into some activities uh, that you perhaps are less familiar with. And God may have a special benefit for you that you won't want to miss. Let's pray. Lord, may your word this evening be a sweet sweet sound in our ears. Amen. When I was asked to speak this weekend, I was told that it would be an observance of the 75th anniversary of CFO. I have a long history with CFO since I was only three years old when I began. And you know, through the years, CFO has, has been my family, not, not just my spiritual family, but I think it's it's been our my relationship family. CFO has been the one part of my life that hasn't changed. You know, CFO was there when I as far back as I can remember, and is still here. And CFO hasn't changed an awful lot uh, since the early years. Uh, so uh, this is a special time uh, for me to be here, and uh, I'll be including an emphasis on the mission and the history of CFO, but more importantly, we're here to grow in our faith and how we may apply it in our daily lives. I'll be sharing with you some lessons that I've learned in CFO. I'll share some teachings uh, from Glenn Clark, our founder. I knew him well. I'll share a little history of the camps, some of my own insights, and how the camps have developed in my life with God. 
I began coming to camp with my father and mother. Uh, before Christmas in 1934, my parents received a Christmas card from a woman by the name of Lena Mathis. Uh, does anyone remember the name Lena Mathis? Does that mean anything to anybody? I, I'd be surprised if, if it did. Uh, until uh, 1931, my father was the assistant pastor uh, of the Woodlawn Baptist Church, which was on the near the campus of the University of Chicago. And Mrs. Mathis was a member of that church. And I want to show you her picture. That is Lena Mathis. Uh, this, uh, this is a page out of a newsletter of the Woodlawn Baptist Church from December, no, for January 1930. See that name? Who wrote it? It was my father <laughs> as the assistant minister. Uh, well, I'll tell you just a little bit about Lena Mathis. Uh, Lena Mathis was a member of this church. Uh, the, uh, the article here tells about her ordination to the Baptist ministry in December 1929. She'd been active in a wide civic life and church life in Chicago. She'd worked with many other women of many churches and denominations to promote civic righteousness, as they called it, in Chicago in the first decade of women's franchise to vote. Uh, you know about Chicago in the 1920s. She graduated from the University of Chicago with a degree in Christian education and sociology, and then graduated from its divinity school, and later received a PhD in Christian education. I didn't know these things until just recently when I found this, this uh, newsletter. Uh, a PhD from the University of Chicago. That's really quite an accomplishment. And for a woman, back in those days, she became the first woman to be ordained by the Baptist denomination in Chicago. She's my favorite example of a woman in ministry. Well, my parents, Roland and Marsha Brown, received her Christmas card, and in the envelope was a little booklet entitled, The Lord's Prayer by Glenn Clark. Um, my father read the book with great interest He'd been most interested in prayer for all of his life. He'd read many books, studied the Bible, listened to speakers and teachers. And he saw that Glenn Clark practiced and taught prayer as more than a devotional exercise. He wanted to learn more of Glenn Clark's teaching. So on the last page of the book was a reference uh, to a camp farthest out uh, at Lake Coronas in Minnesota. And here, this is the 1952 edition of the book, and it's, the notice is still there. And the camp is still going on uh, at Lake Coronas in Minnesota, even, even today. Well, this led to our family attending CFO for the first time. And I remember that first camp that we went to in 1935. I was three years old. I do remember it. Uh, and our attendance continued every year at Coronas and then at many other places for as long as any of us lived. After about 10 years, Glenn invited my father to be a CFO speaker and my mother to be a leader in devotion and motion, and creative art and writing and meditations in many CFO camps. But what made this book, The Lord's Prayer, so vital to my parents and, and many others? I recently read it again. It was first published in 1930, 
By 1952, 200,000 copies were in print, and definitely many more copies today. And I'll share with you some highlights of the book, expecting that they'll be helpful to you. In the, in the introduction, uh, Glenn begins with his boyhood. After his brother's death from appendicitis, he sank into sorrow and groping for a year. But when he learned the wonders of astronomy and the far reaches of space and time, they convinced him of the truth of immortality. He began to read the Bible. A verse from Psalm 3 caught his attention. Acknowledge him in all thy ways, and he will direct thy paths. He decided that he was able to do anything if he left the outcome entirely in God's hands. His creative mind began to imagine that he had a compass inside of him. You know, a compass to change direction. When he was oriented correctly, north was really north to him. But when he began to worry about the outcomes of his efforts, or about losing popularity, or became depressed about his health, north became south. <laughs> He wrote from a radiant, magnetic, unselfish, happy person, unhappy person, I became a self-conscious, calculating, timid, eccentric young fellow, groping my way along, often right, sometimes wrong, but missing so much of the joy in the world. He eventually went through Grinnell College and earned a PhD in the classics at Harvard University. He would enter a teaching career if he could find a good situation. Eventually, he took a, a junior position on the English department at the small, struggling McAllister College in St. Paul. Now, it's not small and struggling today. In fact, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan, is a graduate of McAllister College. But one day at the college, he heard Dr. DeWitt Wallace speak in the chapel on the Lord's Prayer. And Dr. Wallace later founded Reader's Digest magazine with the support of many admirers, including Glenn. While speaking, Dr. Wallace said that the Lord's Prayer could be recited in less than one minute. Well, at home that evening, Glenn found that he could recite it rapidly, as in many churches, in 15 seconds. <laughs> but if you went more slowly, as in his own church, it took 30 seconds. But he was aware that apparently Jesus would spend half the night praying this prayer. The prayer of Jesus would have been a communion with God, not a recitation to God. It was for him a framework for prayer, like a carpenter's framework. The prayer begins, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And Glenn comments on several of the words. Father, God is a God of love, not a God of anger. The Pharisees of Jesus' day needed to know this, as do many people today. God is a better father to his earthly children than we are uh, than we are to our children. We fathers will give only good things to our children. And the heavenly father gives even better things to his children. If we have a lesser idea of God than this, that raises cringing fear or mistrust, we'll ruin any prayer that we pray. So we begin every prayer by putting ourselves in the Father's hands. I'll inject here an insight from Frank Wabach. The word our in our Father is intentional. Frank said that when we begin praying the Lord's Prayer, we should imagine that the O in our represents everyone in the world for all of us are his children. And when Frank would travel about and speak 
he would often carry with him a a globe that he would blow up like a balloon and put down in front so everybody could see this round world. Well, the O represents everyone in the world. And when we pray this prayer, I guess we become like priests on behalf of the entire world. Hallowed is an important word. It means holy or pure or perfect or flawless or clean. Before we do an important task, we often wash our hands. To communicate effectively with a hallowed father, we need to be clean on the inside as well as on the outside. On a Sunday morning, we come to church to worship. This includes prayer, singing praises, hearing instruction in God's word, contributing, and getting ourselves right with God. We brought a significant gift the offering plate coming our way. And then we remember a neighbor, a co-worker, or a family member with whom we've recently argued. Our relationship is strained. And I can hear Jesus whispering in our ear. Put that gift back in your pocket. You're not ready to give it. And after church, we go in love. We go with love in our heart. We straighten out this matter. And then we return to the next service with our gift. You truly want a father-child relationship with God? Jesus tells us specifically how to do this. In the Gospel of Matthew, several verses before the Lord's Prayer. Love your enemies. And pray for those who wrong you, that you may be children of your Father who is in heaven. Love your enemies and pray for those who wrong you, that you may be children of your Father who is in heaven. Yes, that's how to be God's child. Love your enemies. And he explains, the Heavenly Father sends sunshine and rain on both good people and bad people. And if you want to be his child, his heir, you must do the same. Glenn writes, think of God as all-loving, all-powerful, absolutely perfect. Wipe from the glass of your vision the mist of self-centeredness that clogs the passage of the rays of light. Our Father who art in heaven. To Glenn, this is half the prayer, the bigger half, making oneself ready to step into the presence of the Most High. To speak this first line of the Lord's Prayer may require an hour of preparation. Glenn continues with the next line. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The concept of God's kingdom is central to the teaching of the great club. God's kingdom isn't primarily a place or a realm. It's a reign, a relationship. We know without question that in heaven, God's reign is without challenge. And his subjects in heaven obey him voluntarily, immediately, and with 100% compliance on earth as it is in heaven. We pray that the same relationship between king and subjects, between the ruler and the rule, be established and maintained on earth just as it is in heaven. And this is why Glenn established the camp's farthest out, to be a special place where campers would practice obedience to the king thoughtfully, carefully, and intentionally. This sets our attitude toward God, toward other campers, and toward a very needful world. A CFO is intended to be a bit of heaven on earth for a few days. With this brief training, we could return to our homes and churches, our work, our recreation, and our civic life to continue the skills and practices we've learned at CFO. 
thy will be done. That tells us to think of this ideal kingdom of love as flowing through us. We're a part of it. We're not dictating to God. We're not trying to control or shape the flow of God's kingdom except according to God's plan. Our place in this rights plan is that of a mere channel through which God may direct his stream of consciousness. A small addition that I'll make to this teaching from Glenn is that our possibilities in prayer don't end by inserting thy will be done or if it be thy will in our prayers. What we ask for in prayer involves searching God's will in the scriptures, seeking counsel from trusted Christian friends and considering how the answer to our prayer may affect the health of the wider kingdom. My conviction is that God's will is always for health and wholeness. God always wants us to pray for healing. However, we won't tell God how the healing is to take place, or if it's to be in this life, or in the next life. When we're convinced that a prayer is totally to fulfill God's will, I believe that we can pray with greater, greater power. And often when I'm praying for someone who is ill, praying for their 100% healing I just have a feeling that God is inside of me, and I'm, I'm doing this in God's behalf, and God and I are kind of attuned together. I know this is, this is what he wants. I'd like to, to inject it here an item from my father's teaching on the Lord's Prayer. Those of us who were ministers have probably been taught some Hebrew grammar. <laughs> Now, don't be frightened here. Uh, this won't hurt at all. <laughs> A bit of this grammar that Dad would recite is that when three clauses in Hebrew are followed by a modifying phrase, the phrase modifies all three preceding clauses. Sounds complicated, doesn't it? Well, it's not. The Gospel of Matthew is filled with Hebrew expressions. Uh, Bible scholars suspect that Matthew was originally written in Hebrew and later translated into Greek, which was then the language of commerce in the Mediterranean world. In the Lord's Prayer, we have three clauses. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. The following modifying phrase is on earth as it is in heaven. So we can expand the modification. Hallowed be thy name on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That fits beautifully, doesn't it? And meaningfully for each of these clauses. Well, thus far in the Lord's Prayer, we've tuned in with the Father recognize the power of the kingdom and ask that the love of the kingdom flow through us on earth. The Lord's Prayer next addresses three human needs. Need number one, give us this day our daily bread. The need for bread in Jesus' day was vital. It was the basic food, of course, for all of God's children. And today, this involves farming, doesn't it? Farming, fishing, agribusiness, food processing, marketing, preservation, refrigeration, cooking, and serving. All that is a part of receiving the food. More generally today, the need becomes for money, jobs, health, strength, skills, education, employers, the economy, and so forth. Not just for us, not just for America, but for all of God's children. Need number two, 
forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, as the King James Version reads, or forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, as first found in the Geneva Bible, the earliest Bible in the English language, or the ecumenical version, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Matthew's account adds an explanation and an emphasis at the end of the Lord's Prayer. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Thus we must forgive in order to be forgiven. Sin is a transgression of the moral law of God. It includes evil what we may think of as little sins, such as malice, envy, disdain, anger, jealousy, covetousness, disharmony, and so forth. Some theologians may have a struggle with this. It doesn't seem that Calvin or Luther would have said it. It doesn't seem to fit into their neat theological systems where faith is the only necessity. Well, we learn much from Calvin and Luther. But let's interpret what they say. Uh, let's, interpret, let's interpret what they taught in the light of what Jesus taught, and not interpret what Jesus taught in the light of what Calvin and Luther taught. <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, forgiveness by God involves more than easy believism. Faith includes faithfulness. Well, we won't be right with God unless we're right with our neighbor. Need number three in the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Glenn writes that this, this applies, it appears, to the personal temptations, to sins against the laws of nature, those abnormal obsessions that lead to bad habits, whether of drunkenness or sloth or vice. He knows that none of the three petitions are specifically for healing, whether for oneself or others, but they address some of the basic causes for sickness, poor nourishment, lack of harmony with others, and discords with nature and common sense. But Jesus did include healing in his ministry and sent his disciples to preach the gospel and heal the sick. Next in this little book, Glenn Clark identifies three steps for applying the framework of the Lord's Prayer to a specific need. Step one, think of God as the God of purity, love and purity, power and holiness. I remember Fred, a member of one of my churches. He'd had a stroke and was home from the hospital. I found him sitting in his rocker. His wife, Edith, was there. He was a committed Christian. When he saw me, he asked me the question he'd been asking himself. Why did this happen? And he began rocking in his chair back and forth and said over and over, it's the will of God, it's the will of God, it's the will of God. Putting it more bluntly, why is God doing this to me? Not long after that, he died. It seems that he never gave the God of love and purity, power and holiness the opportunity to restore him, at least in this life. Think of a God of love and purity, of power and holiness. Gene and I wanted to select and buy a house in Lake Worth, Florida, near Gene's cousin, Virginia. It was February 2003. My mother had passed away several weeks before, and we were staying in her house near Chicago, busily disposing of her belongings. How could we find a house 
more than a thousand miles away. We never owned any property. We put it in God's hands. Virginia mailed us a form letter she'd received from a woman in a local real estate office. Her name was Christine. She was Hispanic. I found the agency's site on the internet and learned about Christine. She was from Chicago, and she formerly worked for a REMAX agency in Chicago. Wow, wonderful, from Chicago. I was from Chicago. Everyone from Chicago is a wonderful person. You know that, don't you? <laughs> well, on the internet, she sent us photos and descriptions of several houses, and we flew to West Palm Beach on a Sunday. On Monday, she took us to see several houses that were in new developments to the west of the cities along the coast. Because of those visits, we decided that we'd rather live nearer the ocean in a town or a city and nearer to stores and public transportation. On Wednesday, Christine took us to see a house in Lantana, Florida, less than a mile from the shore, about five miles from Virginia's. We loved it, and we could afford it. We said yes, completed the contract on Thursday. The house was almost new. It had two floors, the latest hurricane protection. <laughs> Located at a development of 19 houses and 50 townhouses and a developmental pool. And Gene was very interested in that. In August, after we had sold my mother's house, we moved to Florida. We have international neighbors all around us. Salvador, Cuba, German, Finnish, Haitian, Dutch, Nigerian, and others. And we immediately found a wonderful church. We joined a small loving church group that meets at home study Bible passages that relate to the next Sunday's sermon and cares for one another. Oh, God is good. So good. God of love and purity and power and holiness. And that's the result of just the first step in applying the Lord's Prayer. Step two from Glenn Clark in applying the Lord's Prayer. Think of the kingdom of heaven as a place reflecting this perfection, love, and purity. Knowing that in heaven there is no place for the existence of the trouble you wish to remove. For example, if someone holds anger or envy against you, or you feel angry or en and envy against someone else, think with all earnestness and conviction that there is no anger or envy in heaven then immediately realize the presence of the opposite, that in your heart of hearts, in heaven, all is peace and infinite love. CFO is, by intention, a small sample of the kingdom of heaven on earth, of harmony and care. Prayer surrounds everything here. Every camp has a council ring which is mainly a year-round prayer group. All decisions for the camp are made in prayer. It may seem strange, but at this camp, before the campers arrive, every room is visited by the council ring and filled with prayer. The bedrooms, the meeting rooms, the dining rooms, the pool, and even the bathrooms. Well, step three is to open the doorway of our prayers to be answered with a realization that the kingdom has already come and that God's will is already being done on earth as it is in heaven. You'll remember that Jesus said that our prayers will be answered before we even pray them. We can put our trust in God that the very best will be done for the need that has been expressed. 
as Harold Hill, a CFO speaker years ago, challenged us. We're the king's kids. And the king's kids go first class all the way. Let's not pray just for little things. Let's also pray for big things. Our God is big enough, bigger than Hurricane Wilma. You know that. Our God is big enough. A friend of CFO in Great Britain, J.B. Phillips, the one who published a paraphrase of the New Testament, also wrote the book, Your God is Too Small. You can get it and read it after you've read the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> Uh, let's get in tune and stay in tune with God's plan for our work. Now it's our tradition for a number of years at CFO to have what we call the nine o'clock prayer. Uh, there are camps, as Gary has reminded us, camps in, what is it, Mayo? Name it, in other places. <laughs> and these go year round many places they start at different times nine o'clock now you know will be uh, eight o'clock in the midwest and seven o'clock in the mountains and so on and so prayers are continuing and as we pray the lord's the nine o'clock prayer uh, we are becoming a part of the, the circle of prayer that goes around the world so let's stand and uh join hands find Find at least one hand, uh, and uh, one hand, to, at least one hand to grab. Uh, and the prayer we pray, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the words just so you'll be reminded. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let there be peace on earth, and let it begin with me. Let us pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let there be peace on earth, and let it begin with me. 